Hello, dear students and friends. The topic of my presentation today is Massive Transfusion Protocol. But let, first, let us see what are those conditions in obstetrics which need massive blood transfusion. Well, essentially, these are those conditions in which there is profuse, excessive bleeding, may it be in pregnancy, that is cases of placenta previa or abruptio placenti, or it could be postnatally or after delivery, like cases of postpartum hemorrhage, which specially requires a massive transfusion protocol to be alerted. So I would be highlighting the basics of a massive transfusion protocol. So a few insights into the massive transfusion protocol. Massive transfusion is established to provide rapid blood replacement in a setting of severe hemorrhage. Early optimal blood transfusion in these cases would help to sustain organ perfusion and oxygenation. Now let us look at the definitions. Massive transfusion has been defined as transfusion of 10 or more than 10 units of whole blood or packed RBCs in 24 hours, 3 or more than 3 units of packed RBC in 1 hour, or 4 and more than 4 blood components in 30 minutes. Now, because blood loss is a continuum, these are only arbitrary cutoffs. This helps in identifying those patients who require ongoing considerations of complex physiological relationships related to cardiac output, oxygen carrying capacity, and hemostasis. So, again, what is massive transfusion? 10 units of RBC in 10, 24 hours, or the total blood volume replaced within 24 hours, or 3 units over 1 hour, or 50% of blood, total blood volume being replaced within 3 hours. Now let us look at the various clinical settings where massive transfusion would be required. Cardiac surgery, essentially it is more important than in cases of liver disease because liver disease leads to reduced production of normal coagulation factors and production of abnormal factors and essentially there would be lots and lots of bleeding. Then the most important for us all is obstetric hemorrhage. A gravid and parturient woman has a hypercoagulable state and has compensatory hyperfibrinolysis. So even if there is a small trigger, this would cause profuse bleeding. Let us look at the management of obstetric hemorrhage with blood components. For this, there should be a clear local protocol on how to manage, which, when, and how these blood components need to be given, and Proper documentation of blood loss is essential so that you can identify that it, is, that it is above the arbitrary limits and transfusion is required. And we need to do blood investigations to guide us as to which component would be needed. This is the mm, PPH, management of PPH, postpartum hemorrhage protocol. Whenever there's major obstetric hemorrhage, more than 1000 ml, then and it is continuing and the patient is in shock, then we need to call for help. At the same time, we need to alert the blood transfusion laboratory so that required amount of blood and blood components can be given. As you can see here, monitoring and investigations and medical management should be started side to side and the medical management is tried for 30 minutes while when we are giving these investigations, we would need to send blood for cross-match, at least four units of RBC. We need fresh frozen plasma, platelets, and cryoprecipitate. So as soon as major obstetric hemorrhage is identified, the blood bank should be alerted, and these products should be made available as soon as possible. So initially what is done is we give three units of packed RBC in one hour. Then According to hemodynamic stability, hemoglobin level, the amount of blood loss, and according to the coagulation profile, then our components given or more packed, more packed RBC are given. Let us see when red blood cells should be used. There is no firm criteria for initiating red blood cell transfusion because there is acute blood loss. The first thing to replace is red cells. 
the decision to provide blood transfusion should be made on clinical and hematological grounds. In an extreme situation, when blood group is unknown, like in a woman who is in full dilatation and has come and delivered in labor room and we do not have investigations and she's bleeding profusely, in those cases, we can give ORH negative red cells. Now, this should be available in a satellite blood fridge, which should be near to the premises of labor room. Staff working in obstetric units should be aware of location of this fridge and Management should ensure that access is possible for blood collection. Then, in which circumstances should fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate be used? Fresh frozen plasma at a dose of 12 to 15 ml per kg should be given for every six units of RBC during a major obstetric hemorrhage. So first we tend to give six units of RBC and then still, if we do not have her coagulation profile and there is continuing ongoing bleeding, we would prefer to give FFP also. Subsequent FFP transfusion should be guided by the results of clotting test if they are available in a timely manner so that we can maintain prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time less than 1.5 times. Regular foot blood counts and coagulation screens should be performed during the bleeding episode. That is PT, APTT and fibrinogen levels are a must. Plasma fibrinogen level above 2 gram per liter should be maintained during ongoing PPH. Cryoprecipitate should be used for fibrinogen replacement. So if levels are less, then cryoprecipitate is given. It is given at a standard dose of two 5-unit pools given in early major obstetric hemorrhage. So if you've given six units of packed RBC, you've given fresh frozen plasma and she's still bleeding, then you would need to give cryoprecipitate. Subsequent cryoprecipitate transfusion should be guided by fibrinogen levels aiming to keep levels above 1.5 gram per liter. FFP and cryoprecipitate should ideally be of the same blood group as recipient. If unavailable, FFP of a different ABO group is acceptable providing that it does not have a high titer of anti-A and anti-B activity. No anti-D prophylaxis is required for RH negative women who receives RH positive FFP and cryoprecipitate. Then the third component is platelets. Our aim should be to maintain a platelet count above 50,000 in an acutely bleeding patient. A platelet transfusion trigger of 75,000 is recommended to provide a margin of safety. The platelets should ideally be group compatible. RH negative women should also receive RH negative platelets. So these are the components which are mainly given in a major obstetric hemorrhage. Packed RBC, a unit of packed RBC is 330 ml stored at 1 to 6 degree, transfused within 4 hours. They are red cells that are spun down and concentrated. Fresh frozen plaza, volume per unit is 200 to 50 ml kept at a very low temperature, minus 18 degree, dose 15 ml per kg. So a woman 70 kg would receive 4 FFP, rich in clotting factors. Platelet concentrate 50 ml storage at 22 to 24 degree and it can be kept for 5 days and transfused within 30 to 60 minutes. Cryoprecipitate, a supernatant precipitate of fresh frozen plasma and this is rich in factor 8 and fibrinogen in cases of hemophilia, this is commonly used. Now, let us look at the ratio in which these components have to be given. So, if you do not have blood investigations and if there is acute blood loss, she started bleeding in front of you and 1000 ml of blood has been lost, it is a major obstetric hemorrhage. In these cases, initially, we tend to give packed RBC. Six units of packed RBC, then FFP, and then still bleeding cryoprecipitate and platelets depending on platelet levels. But in some certain situations, we may require this ratio 1 is to 1 is to 1, in which we need to give one packed RBC, one FFP, one cryo or platelet depending on the situation. This is required in cases in which there is already an existing coagulopathy, like in cases of severe preeclampsia health syndrome or cases of amniotic fluid embolism, or even cases of intrauterine death. So for massive transfusion in most patient population, one is to one is to one ratio of plasma to platelets to packed RBC is generally used. 
plasma is what we call as FFP. It is frozen, fresh frozen plasma and has a volume of 200 to 300 ml. Platelets, one unit of afferous platelet contains 300 billion platelets, one fourth of what normally circulates, one sixth of what is in the body. Because one third of platelets is already concentrated in spleen. But only half of the transfused platelets typically circulate and are functional. Packed RBC, one unit of packed RBC has a volume of 325 ml and it contains 160 to 220 ml of RBCs. Nowadays, we do not use much of whole blood, but whole blood units are, are available in some settings. They can deliver all components in normal ratios without dilution and saline load from RBC additive solution. So it could be useful in those situations when it is freely available and when it is fresh whole blood so that the platelets are still functional. Let's look at what monitoring is required. Transfusions are used initially and lab monitoring should be performed over a course of resuscitation to guide further therapy. Hemoglobin and hemostatic testing is preferably done after five units of packed RBC or as the clinical situation allows. Com we need to do a complete blood count with platelet, prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, and fibrinogen concentration in all these cases. If viscoelastic testing is immediately av available, that is thromboelastography or rotational thromboelastography, these tests would be very useful so that they rule out the dilutional effects of transfusion and their prevention by appropriate component ratios which can be identified by these tests, as well as they prevent development of other complications like DIC. So we can identify the requirement earlier by these because the dilutional effect has been nullified by these tests. Rational use of blood components. So in a case of PPH, what all is required? Initially, we do not have blood, so we give crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloid, up to two liter isotonic crystalloid can be started. Colloid, 1.5 liters of colloid till blood arrives. Blood, if immediate transfusion is indicated in emergency, give group O, RH negative, K negative red cell units, switch to group specific red cells as soon as feasible. The administration of fresh frozen plasma should be guided by hemodynamic testing. If PT or APTT are prolonged and hemorrhage is ongoing, give it 12 to 15 ml per kg. If hemorrhage continues after four units of RBC and hemostatic tests are unavailable, then give four units of FFP. This is how in continuing hemorrhage, one is to one ratio is maintained. Administer one pool of platelets if hemorrhage is ongoing and platelet count is less than 75,000. Give cryoprecipitate, that is two pools, if hemorrhage is ongoing and fibrinogen is less than two gram per cent. Well, after giving these components, the main therapeutic goals are we should achieve a hemoglobin greater than 8, then we can stop. Platelet concentration should be more than 50,000. Prothrombin time less than 1.5 times normal. APTT less than 1.5 times normal. And fibrinogen more than 2. Then one of these could be considered objective major transfusion triggers. That is a critical administration threshold that is if more than 3. RBC units have been given in one hour, then it is um, major, obstetric major obstetric hemorrhage and uh, massive transfusion protocol is needed. Or if the shock index is more than one, ABC score more than two, or RABT score more than two. RABT score is usually used in, in uh, trauma settings. Now, if you recognize blood loss, it means you need to trigger massive transfusion protocol. And in these cases, we need a team. There should be a team leader. There should be um, workers who can go to the blood bank and bring blood components and an obstetrician and anesthetist who would work, who would be um, monitoring the women and trying to identify the cause of hemorrhage and trying to deal with the situation. The first and most important thing is to alert the blood bank. First trigger would be 
to tell the blood bank to immediately prepare first transfusion package, which should contain six units of RBC, four units of FFP, and the first package should be delivered within 35 minutes of initial order. Still, if there is bleeding, have a second package ready within 35 minutes of first package. Second package should contain the same six units of RBC, four units of FFP, one single donor platelet, or one six pack random platelets. Still bleeding, then third package, which would be again ready within 35 minutes, six blood, six units of RBC, four units of FFP, and one 10 pack of pooled, cry pooled cryoprecipitate. Now, every hospital should have their own massive transfusion protocol and um, should be, they should identify the trigger. And these are, these are examples of various transfusion protocols and we can adopt one protocol depending on these. So they should have everything in written in a flow chart. So initial management of bleeding, what all ha has to be done various resuscitation measures, if bleeding does not stop, surgical consideration, then special, special clinical situations, like if she's already on warfarin or if there's a head injury and if there's a hemorrhage, the use of cell salvage is there in some countries, the dosages should be written and various other points should be included in the chart. Similarly, this is another massive transfusion protocol template, which suggests that initially, uh, once you've identified massive hemorrhage, do a baseline investigations and then identify and activate massive transfusion protocol, optimize, monitor, and aim for these various levels. An important thing is that when you've given blood and blood components and bleeding has been controlled, then you need to notify the transfusion lab to seize the massive transfusion protocol. This is another example of the ACOG massive transfusion protocol. Then the various complications which could arise from such a massive transfusion of blood and blood components. Acute complications include acute lung injury, trally, tachycardic overload, excessive use of Blood components could cause citrate toxicity, hypocalcemia, hypothermia, allergic reaction, hyperkalemia, hemodilution, dilutional coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, electrolyte and acid base imbalance, infection, multi-organ failure, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. However, there are some delayed problems like hemolysis, transfusion associated um, heart problems, microchimerism, transfusion transmitted infection, and post-transfusion pergura. So a take-home message, trigger a plan whenever there is excessive hemorrhage. Collect a team. We need to give tranexamic acid in addition to other eutrotonics. Do the tests early. Transfusion to the target values. Temperature management is essential and when bleeding is controlled, terminate the code or cease the massive transfusion protocol. A few recommendations. There is a need to define protocol triggers and an algorithm for preparation and delivery of blood products, including continued support. The protocol should be updated annually and practiced in skill drills to inform and train the relevant persons. And an important message, keep calm and follow the protocol. So thank you. There are many other videos on my YouTube channel. You can subscribe and go through them.